Good morning, everyone, and welcome. I'm Dr. Tara Karen. Um, I'm the Vice Chair for Quality and Innovation at the Department of Family and Community Medicine at the University of Toronto and a family doctor at St. Michael's Hospital. I'm really pleased to be the moderator and one of our co-hosts for uh, today's session, Changing the Way We Work and Update on COVID-19 Vaccines. This is a series that we've pulled together with the Ontario College of Family Physicians. And to that end, I'm gonna turn it over to the OCFP president, Dr. Liz McGough. Good morning, everyone. Delighted to be joining today. Um, as Tara said, the Ontario College is uh, pleased to co-host this event. We're delighted that so many of you are joining us today. We have a great um, panel for you. It's going to be, um, I know, incredibly informative, and I'm looking forward to it myself. So without, uh, we will introduce ourselves in a moment, or the panelists will. So next slide. I'll just do the land acknowledgement now and um, so we acknowledge that the lands on which we are hosting this meeting include the traditional territories of many nations. The OCFP and the DFCM recognize that the many injustices experienced by the Indigenous people of what um, we now call Canada continue to affect their health and well-being. The OCFP and the DFCM respect that Indigenous people have rich cultural and traditional practices and that have been known to improve health outcomes. I invite all of us to reflect on the territories you are calling in from, and I am calling in from Ottawa, so this is unceded Algonquin and Anishinaabe territory. Um, and as we commit ourselves to gaining knowledge, forging a new culturally safe relationship and contributing to reconciliation. Next slide. Thanks, Liz. I think the uh, land acknowledgement for me is always a time to reflect on the injustices um, done to Indigenous people uh, here uh, on this land um, in the past, but also in the present. However, a silver lining was this article that I read recently um, where, you know, we are prioritizing um, Indigenous communities for the vaccine, which is wonderful. And the Indigenous communities have been working hard in remote areas to figure out how to bring the vaccine there. And hopefully in a future call, we'll have some more information for you on the activities happening in Indigenous communities. Next slide. So, um, you know, we organized this session back in April and we've been having them, you know, bi-weekly and then monthly and now probably bi-weekly again um, as a place for family doctors to come together to share information and learn from each other at a time when we know change, information is changing so rapidly. Um, we always knew that we wouldn't necessarily have all the answers um, when we came together, but that we would learn from each other and we would be transparent about the information that we do have. And, and that's the spirit with which we're coming to, to you today um, on this um, panel on COVID vaccines. Uh, next slide. Um, our committee um, plans these uh, events. And if you have speaker recommendations um, or topic recommendations, please give them to us at the end and during the evaluation. Next slide. Um, we do have a great panel today um, who are gonna introduce themselves, um, family doctors and leadership roles, uh, helping with the vaccine rollout, um, as well as an allergist immunologist who will be able to answer um, many of the questions I know you have. Next slide. And of course, we're welcome to have um, our, our usual guests, uh, uh, Liz Maga and David Kaplan. Next slide. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to the panelists one by one to introduce themselves and speak to their conflicts of interest. Uh, Noah Ivers. Thanks, Tara. Uh, I'm Noah Ivers. I'm a family doc at Women's College Hospital. Uh, I uh, am um, a Canada Research Chair in Implementation of Evidence-Based Practice and spend a lot of my time thinking about how we can put uh, best practices uh, in, you know, in, into real day-to-day -day care. Um, my conflicts are, uh, you know, listed there. Um, they're mostly around um, giving advice around how we implement and or evaluate best practices. Um, I'll leave it at that. Thanks. Hugh Boyd? All my uh, disclosures are essentially places that uh, pay me for administrative uh, places. I guess I should put OHIP in there too. Um, but I've been pharma clean for my entire career. Can you introduce yourself too? Let us know. My apologies. Hugh Boyd, um, a care of the elderly physician uh, practicing just outside of the, the Hamilton area, uh, medical director at St. Joseph Villa Alexander Place, chief of staff at St. Joseph Health Center Guelph, and the chair of the Ontario Medical Association's section on long term care and care of the elderly. Thank you. Um, Zainab Abdurrahman. Aman. Hi, so I'm Zainab Abdurrahman. I'm an allergist and clinical immunologist. Um, so 
I, like many allergists, work in multiple <laughs> locations, so mostly Toronto West and Mississauga, but at McMaster Children's Hospitals, where I have my vaccine allergy clinic, which is a pediatric vaccine allergy clinic, which is part of the special immunization clinic, which is across Canada. And so my disclosures are listed mostly due to honoraria for giving various talks on various aspects of allergy and immunology. Thank you. Thanks. Next slide. Liz? Um, hi, so again, I'm Liz Mugga. I'm a family doctor in Ottawa, and um, I don't have any disclosures other than the honorary I receive um, for my role as president with the Ontario College. Thank you. I'm David Kaplan. I'm a family doctor in North York and the chief of clinical quality uh, at um, Ontario Health in the Clinical Programs and Quality Institutes branch. Uh, I receive uh, employment uh uh, compensation from Ontario Health, from the government, um, and an honoraria from the OCFP. Uh, and I'm, as I mentioned, Tara Kieran, and uh, I do uh, receive um, some salary support and grants. Um, the only for-profit uh, company for, is Gilead Sciences for a grant on hepatitis C. Next slide. So we do have an unprecedented number of people joining this webinar um, from all over Ontario, which is incredible. Um, we are gonna do our best to answer all of your questions. Next slide. Um, we uh, already have, I see people familiar with how to ask and answer questions, but I'm just going to go over. If you have a question for our panelists, please put it in the Q&A. That's the easiest way, given the large number of people on the call for us to keep track of them. We will either answer it live or by typing. Um, uh, we hope to try and get to as many of them as possible. Because there's so many people on though, um, please use the thumbs up feature. So if there's already a question on the Q&A that you like, use the thumbs up, it'll move it higher and we'll make sure that we get to those ones that are liked by many people. Um, if you yourself have something to share or comment on, um, it's a resource or you want to share your own experience, uh, we've always appreciated that and I'd suggest you put that kind of thing in the chat. Um, so Q&A for the questions, the chat for your experiences. Next slide. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Noah Ivers, who's going to take us through um, the two vaccines that have been approved uh, in, in Canada, and, and then also speak uh, briefly to the operational aspects of the rollout here in Ontario. So Noah, over to you. Thanks, everyone. Um, so I'm not going to spend much time on this slide uh, because I am far from a vaccinologist. I'm just a family doc. Uh, but um, I think the key thing for us to be aware of uh, when we're thinking about the various vaccine platforms that are out there uh, and in development or already approved is that ultimately they all want to end up at the same place. And this is, I think, the key thing, if we're going to explain things effectively to our patients and our communities, is that every vaccine ultimately works by finding, figuring out what is the key signature of uh, the pathogen that we're worried about, in this case, um, the COVID virus. And um, in that regard, it's this so-called spike protein. And so every single um, lab that's working on vaccines and all the vaccines that are approved the bottom line is that they all want to present the spike protein to our immune system so that our immune system is ready to see it and fight it later. Um, no matter whether it's a live attenuated virus or an mRNA uh, technology, it's all, it's, all, um, uh, it's all ending up in the same place. It's all ending up presenting the spike protein to our immune system. The mRNA specifically, I'll just spend a moment talking about um, you probably heard before, the idea here is that um, we, uh, we have lots of mRNA in our body all the time, as we all know. Uh, it does not live in our nucleus and it cannot interact with our DNA. Um, and the mRNA is used to build protein. In this case, uh, the genius uh, scientist figured out what is the mRNA needed to build the spike protein. And it basically co-ops the normal protein building capacity in our cells to build the spike protein. And then it degrades and it is gone. 
The only thing that is left after that is the immune response, the immediate re immune response, which causes the side effects and the delayed uh, memory that is there so that anytime our immune system sees the, um, the spike protein later, it's ready to respond and, and keep us from getting sick. So that's the main thing I wanted to talk about on that slide. And for sure, we can talk more questions and answers, but let's go to the next slide. So uh, as you all know, there are two mRNA uh, technology-based uh, vaccines that have uh, been approved, uh, the Pfizer and the Moderna. Uh, both were published in New England. Um, they are both open access and you can Google them uh, and decide to you know, peruse them instead of look at my slides or listen to my voice. And that's perfectly fine. Um, I want to just highlight a few things about the Pfizer vaccine, highlight a few things about the Moderna vaccine before we move on. Uh, first of all, the Pfizer vaccine was tested in over 40,000 uh, participants. That means uh, half of those were in the um, vaccine group, half placebo, of course. Um, each in the uh, vaccine group got two shots. So we're talking about uh, 40,000 plus shots given. Um, the effectiveness is 95%. You would have heard that in the media and, uh, and in pr previous webinars. Uh, what does that really mean? It's, it's about the proportion who got sick uh, within a few weeks after the second shot. All right, so we're looking at 170 confirmed cases of COVID-19 is the number of people who got sick in this trial. Uh, only eight of those were in the vaccine group. So no, no, nothing we do in medicine is perfect. Uh, and indeed, uh, this vaccine is not perfect. Some people may still get sick from COVID, but that, that, uh, that difference between the groups, and you see it, the difference between the blue and the red uh, graph um, uh, lines on, on, the, on, the, on the graph, on the line graph, uh, it's exceptionally impressive, as impressive as any uh, vaccine we've ever had, basically, for any condition. Um, and the effectiveness was consistent across all sorts of subgroups. Um, they made a very special effort to include uh, a wide range of participants. Um, and as you would have all heard, the limitation with the Pfizer vaccine is that uh, it is not very stable. It requires extreme cold chain. Um, and I'm sure we'll come back to that because that has major implications in terms of the rollout. But let's go to the next slide. Um, again, with the Moderna vaccine just published in New England uh, now a week ago, um, uh, and you can go download it, uh, just Google Moderna vaccine New England and you'll find it. Uh, here we had 30,000 participants. I want to emphasize how big that is again. Uh, the usual vaccine trials have a tenth of that. Uh, so now we have 70,000 participants in these two mRNA trials. And often vaccines are approved with only about 5,000 participants. Uh, so we actually have heaps of data, uh, heaps of evidence coming about these COVID vaccines. And so when people are concerned that it's new and we don't know yet, actually one of the counter arguments is actually we have 10 times as much data as we usually have for any, any vaccine approval here. The efficacy is basically the same, 94% versus 95. I don't, I don't, you know, no human brain can make a difference of that. Um, and they calculated basically the same way. You know, they had a, a 95 total cases. Um, five of those were in the vaccine group. Uh, okay, at follow up. Uh, the really interesting thing to note is that absolutely nobody in the vaccine group for the Moderna vaccine got so called severe COVID. Okay, and so it's 100% effective to prevent severe COVID. And they, when things are 100% effective, statistically, you can't even put a confidence interval around that. Um, it just works. Uh, so that's really amazing. Again, they made a special effort to, um, to recruit a variety of participants. And uh, there was no differences across subgroups when they, when they tried to see, oh, does it work less well in the elderly and so on. Um, here, the cold chain is uh, less severe, um, uh, and so that's allowing, uh, that has implications again for the rollout. It allows us to move the Moderna a little easier. I want to just highlight something about side effects, though, before I move on. Um, the side effects are common. Uh, 
uh, people getting this will have a sore arm, especially younger people, especially after the second shot. It would appear that the Moderna vaccine gives uh, sore arms uh, than the Pfizer vaccine, um, uh, although very hard to compare exactly. Um, and that may be because there's uh, maybe more R mRNA uh, in the Moderna vaccine than in the Pfizer vaccine. But it's about the same. And most people, if you talk to folks that have gotten their vaccine, they say it feels similar to, to this year's flu shot, maybe less bad. I personally found this year's flu shot quite sore. Um, in terms of other side effects, um, fever is actually quite rare. Uh, and I wanna highlight this because it's relevant for us as family docs. We may hear of patients of ours getting fever. And if, if that happens, I think it's important to get those people COVID tested. Uh, because fever runs around 4%. And right now, uh, community spread is so prevalent that um, I, I think I'd be more apt to attribute a fever post-vaccine to them actually catching COVID in the days prior to the vaccine than actually just reacting to the vaccine. The next thing I'd like to say about side effects is that we need to counsel our patients that these are a sign of our immune system doing what it's supposed to do. Our immune system can't generate the memory we want it to generate unless it reacts to that spike protein that it was presented to, uh, that was presented to it. And when our immune system gets revved up, we get soreness, we get muscle aches, we get uh, sometimes very rarely a fever. Uh, we may get uh, enlarged lymph nodes, uh, that, that is also quite rare. Um, but you know, we'll, we'll feel relatively not great, um, but that's actually a sign that the vaccine's doing what it should. Um, and it does settle quite quickly. Um, and so I just want to emphasize that so that we can talk to our patients about it. Uh, next slide. So uh, there's no sense me belaboring all the details because all the details are there for you on the CEP website. And if you Google CEP vaccine, you're going to see everything about the rollout, um, details about each of the approved vaccines. And, you know, I know the team is already getting ready to post the AstraZeneca details when those, uh, when that gets approved. Um, and importantly, details around um, uh, how to talk to patients who are hesitant. And we're going to talk more about that, uh, I think, through uh, the course of this discussion. Um, no. And I, I just want to highlight all those logos at the top. This is truly a collaborative process. Um, because all of us, you know, it's going to be Team Ontario here trying to get everybody immunized. Uh, next slide. You know what? Actually, before we move to the next slide, I'm going to yeah. actually pause us here because there oh, are yeah, a lot of questions. You. And um, I just want to get to some of the questions now because they're relevant to what you just said. Um, so one of the questions um, Will, William Shannon asked, um, and it's been liked by many people, is there any long-term data in humans on the use of mRNA similarly to the new vaccines, potential unique adverse effects? Uh, so what I usually, I, we get this question a lot and I'm glad that it came up. Um, the, the reason we need to follow people long-term is to figure out how long immunity will last for. In vaccineology, usually it is felt that uh, vaccine side effects are going to occur and be caught within six weeks. And that is why the trials were set up to monitor people for eight weeks. Now, of course, everybody in the trial are still being followed. And indeed, there's surveillance. Uh, there's millions of people around the world uh, getting surveillance now uh, who are post-vaccine. Um, but if you think about the, the sort of immunology process, on, oh gosh, I'm gonna embarrass myself with Zainab here. Um, the, um, the mRNA is gone pretty quickly, like within hours, maybe day. And uh, the immune response is gone as soon as you're feeling better, the initial immune response. So any side effects you're gonna get is gonna be likely you know, in the process of that and in the process of developing the, the memory, so-called. Um, and then the other thing I know, you know that we need to emphasize to people is that although we haven't done a population-wide mRNA technology-based vaccine rollout before, mRNA technology per se is not super new. Um, we have 10 years of uh, experience with it. It's used um, in uh, all sorts of conditions, actually, including cancer treatments. Um, so, 
So, but just to emphasize the long-term data we're waiting for is how long does immunity last for? Um, I'm personally not terribly, you know, excited to figure out, oh, they followed everybody in the trial for an extra year. Did they get new side effects? Because we actually don't expect that. Um, thanks, Noah. So David Kaplan actually wrote in the chat that the first mRNA vaccine was used in humans in 2009. So hopefully that's um, reassuring to some folks. Um, uh, you know, this is a, the next question is a question for, um, you know, or maybe it's for Zainab. Um, what are the immunocompromised states in which we will avoid COVID vaccination? So I don't know who wants to speak to that. Tara, if you can, if you can have the document brought up, that might be helpful for Zainab to speak to. Yeah, this Brian, can you um, end the slides and put up the PDF? So for those of you, you know, we um, there are there are also a number of questions in the um, Q and A related to breastfeeding and pregnant women. Um, so there's recently been guidance that has just come out. It's actually not been posted online yet, but we're going to just share it with you here. Um, so Brian's just going to pull up the PDF, um, and it speaks to pregnant and breastfeeding women and also immunocompromised um, patients. And we and so are just. Just as an FYI, I'm going to let Zainab speak to it, but just as an FYI, all this is going to end up on the CEP website, I'm sure, before end of day. Okay, great. So maybe we can scroll down to the part, Brian, where it talks about immunocompromised patients. So um, keep going. Uh, yeah, autoimmune. Oh, sorry, we passed it there. Yeah. So Zainab, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Sure. Um, so I think the one big thing that's important, and you'll see actually with this document as well, is that immunocompromised state is really, it's a mixed bag. There's a lot of different conditions that actually span many different specialties in terms of those who fall into this category, and the defects can be very different. Typically for most forms of immunocompromised, we're worried about live vaccines because then those who are unable to fight essentially and dis basically get disseminated vaccine strain. So those are the main ones we're often worried about in these states, but this is not a live vaccine and you actually can't get infected from the mRNA vaccine. It only makes a small portion of the virus, which is just the spike protein. It doesn't actually recreate the entire virus in your body. So from that perspective, each of the different immunocompromised states are um, essentially assessed and there's different guidance based on if it's more immunocompromised from some of the um, GI defects versus rheumatological. And actually each of those have their own statements that you can link to. They're also in that document, but essentially it's really a risk benefit. There are some Im immunocompromised states where vaccination is not often very helpful because they're not able to actually create um, antibodies that you need them to. For example, if you have a patient who um, has severe defects in their immune system and require IVIG to replenish because they're not able to make their own immunoglobulins, they may not respond very well to the vaccine. And then over time, they're actually gonna get a lot of the immunoglobulins from everyone else who is vaccinated when they're getting it from their bag of IVIG each month. So it's not that we would say it's contraindicated for those patients, it's just they may not respond as much to it but there's not um, a specific hard contraindication for these groups, but it is a risk benefit. And depending on what kind of immunosuppression or immunocompromise we're talking about. I just wanna, uh, there is a next page that lists a few conditions. Uh, Brian, can you go to the next page of the PDF? Oh, Brian, Off you can PDF, you Brian. back and just scroll down from where Sorry we're... for not being clear. That's okay. Um, so while we're waiting for that to come up, um, I'm wondering if either you, Noah, or David could actually speak to pregnancy and breastfeeding since um, we're on that document and it does speak to that. Uh, David, do you want that or do you want me to take it? Go ahead, Noah. Um, so um, many of you would have seen uh, the wonderful article and advocacy by our, our colleague, Dr. Bogler. Um, um, encouraging hospitals to follow the SOGC guidance. Uh, and indeed in this, uh, sorry, before I talk about it, I just wanna, Zainab, do, do you wanna finish your thought around this, some of the specific yeah. So this actually talks a little bit about, um, 
So this refers to the different um, statements that are by the different societies. For example, if you have someone who is post-transplant, their immunosuppression is different than someone who has um, a different form of immunocompromise. And so that actually has the different statements from rheumatology, from transplant, as well as gastroenterology. So these are great to kind of address some of those specific conditions for your patients. So you can actually um, use those documents to help you in those discussions as well. Yeah, I would highlight that e-consult might be useful for this. Um, and, you know, um, if it's quite complicated, but for the vast majority of patients with stable conditions that we see and we manage, uh, we are gonna recommend that um, ben known benefits of preventing COVID outweigh any theoretical issues. And even for many people with immunosuppression uh, situations, the conversation with their providers around timing, not necessarily around whether they should get it. Um, in regard to breastfeeding, um, so the new guidance, sorry, Brian to scroll up. Yeah, please. In regard to breastfeeding, the guidance is very simple. Go get the uh, vaccine. Um, we don't have data and we want to acknowledge that, but go get the vaccine. There's no reason to, for at all to believe uh, that there would be any concerns. Uh, for pregnancy, it's slightly more complicated than that. Again, we have no data, um, but in general, the recommendation is go get the vaccine. Um, now, we want people to have a conversation or at least acknowledge that, they, that there is no data here um, and that we're working on you know, uh, you know, basics, you know, physiology, as opposed to um, epidemiology, which we, we would like to be working on. Um, but uh, in general, the recommendation is uh, go get the vaccine. Uh, there's no reason to believe there's any impact on fertility. Yeah. At all. I'm, I'm just posting now in the, a link in the chat. There's um, a lot of misinformation about potential impacts on fertility. I, I, there's no reason whatsoever to believe that. It is our job as, as a team uh, reaching out to all our patients to debunk that, um, that, that myth. So I'm just posting in the chat, um, a link to a Twitter post where Tully has posted the special population informed consent. Um, the, you know, the, the SOGC and the Ontario SOGC equivalent has recommended not needing this, but this is the, uh, way for now that the government has requested that, that you document the conversation with pregnant patients. People like Noah and I have been trying to push the general's task force to not require these sorts of things because uh, very much worried about the hurdles to get people vaccinated. Thanks to both of you. Um, so, and I noticed that um, we put the link to Tally's article in the chat. Um, I think the, there, another question that has come up um, is uh, related to, um, and maybe I'll, I don't know if Noah, you can answer this or, or uh, someone else, but what are the implications of having more than 21 days between the first and second vaccine dose? If supply issues develop, this may be a concern. This is such a good question. Oh my goodness. Uh, um, you know, the reality is uh, the trial allowed for some delay. So some delay is totally reasonable. Uh, the trial allowed for, I, I believe seven, maybe even 14 days delay, I think seven. Um, so one week delay is, is, is no, no issue. We can expect the same efficacy. Um, my understanding from the vaccinologists is that uh, delaying can be beneficial in the long run, actually, in terms of, it, but, but we just don't know with this vaccine right now. Um, I think, you know, this is a really complex situation where we're balancing real world supply issues uh, in a pandemic versus what we know, over, uh, you know, from this particular vaccine versus what we know from you know, basic science. I, I, maybe, I, I don't envy those responsible for making that decision. Maybe we can bring up, Noah, you have a slide with uh, what the federal government has told the government here in Ontario to expect with regard to Pfizer um, shipments. 
this month, just so that people can see that we do have a supply chain that's coming in. Ryan, can you bring back up our slides? Um, and what? So I think the next little bit, it might be a good time to transition. No, you can speak maybe a little bit about the, the vaccination rollout plan. Yeah. And, and for those who want more detail on the special populations, again, I'm sure it's all going to be on the CEP website as, you know, uh, as soon as CEP is allowed to post it, which I think is today. Um, okay, so the rollout, uh, many of you would have heard the basics. Yeah, there's three phases. Um, we're trying to get um, um, as, as many of the folks in long-term care and retirement homes done as possible in uh, ideally all of them and all healthcare workers by the end of March. That is what's been stated. Um, and, uh, you know, hopefully that happens. Um, I think we will have all long-term care residents and retirement homes uh, residents done sooner, much sooner than that. Uh, whether we can get every single healthcare worker and all this, you know, all patient-facing staff uh, done in that time uh, is to be determined. But that that is the goal. Um, and as increasing sort of supply comes in, including additional vaccines, which we're going to have to have whole additional talks about because there'll be different sets of side effects and so on. Um, uh, that's when we'll start seeing broader uh, broader distribution. Um, you know, we'll have, there'll be the role of mass vaccination clinics uh, in the community. There'll be us giving vaccine in our offices, community pharmacy as well. Uh, and that's sort of as we head into stage three. Okay, so, so I would think of stage phase two as sort of an interim phase and stage three sort of as the broad community rollout uh, where vaccine is going to be everywhere. Now, how are we going to get vaccine everywhere? Let's go to the next slide. Um, you can see here, we're expecting a great deal more um, Pfizer to come in. Um, and I'll talk about that for a moment. I'll talk about Moderna expectations for a moment. Uh, and then, you know, we get to phase three because Canada has purchased more vaccine per capita than any other country in the world. Um, and we, we know that the AstraZeneca data are already under review. Uh, between me and my, a thousand of my closest friends here, I would expect AstraZeneca to be approved this month. Um, we'll see. And, um, you know, I think the Janssen uh, vaccine, which is wonderful because it's a one shot uh, dose, uh, you know, there's things look promising there too. And we have a whole bunch of that pre purchased. So we'll see. We'll see what the data shows. Uh, anyway, so for Pfizer, you can see we're expecting, you know, in Ontario, 80,000 a week over the next few weeks. Um, there are 70,000 plus people living in long-term care homes. So like, there is no reason why we shouldn't, frankly, have already immunized everybody living in long-term care homes. Um, and every day we delay, um, is, is, it, it means more people will die unnecessarily. Um, the way in which that's gonna happen, let me just go to the next slide. Um, we can see also Moderna has come in. Um, Moderna is easier to move, as I said before, uh, but we have much less of it. Um, and so it is actually a logistical nightmare. And I, you know, it would be nice if we had public health and primary care um, on the task force, but in some ways, like having logistics experts uh, is, is like quite useful. Um, in this regard, like, you know, this, it's quite complicated what the supply is, will it come, comes from the federal government, get to every hospital, et cetera, uh, the freezers and so on. Uh, let me just go to the next slide to explain what we know so far. Um, so um, I'll leave this slide up here about the primary care uh, action council of all the groups working together, trying to make sure that we are engaged and involved Here's what we have figured out so far, and uh, communications will be coming out to everybody about the rollout uh, as we know it. Um, over the next little while, um, the sort of ownership uh, we expect uh, in terms of vaccination to long-term care and retirement homes will slowly shift from hospitals 
to public health units. Um, those public health units are going to need help from us as primary care professionals to um, reach out to right now, long-term care and retirement homes, but over time, uh, vulnerable populations in our communities and indeed our entire communities. Um, and so now is the opportunity for us um, to start building relationships with our public health units, relationships that ideally should have been built, you know, generations ago, um, but, and, and are great in some areas and are weak in others. Um, and so one of the roles of this uh, Vaccination Action Council is, is realizing that we need to work as one team, uh, including with the hospitals who have the freezers, uh, and be a little more coordinated and efficient in our processes. Again, there's no reason why every single long-term care resident isn't already vaccinated in my mind. Um, and, you know, ideally we can move a lot faster than the goal that was set out uh, by the general around just doing the long-term care residents in the hot spots by the 21st. Um, I think, you know, so that, that is going to happen actually. In many in many regions, we're already uh, done, um, and so you know that's that's due to advocacy of uh, folks like all of you. Um, I think that's I should start. Noah, yeah, so no, I, I I noticed that somebody did put into the chat, and maybe we can just put it back into the chat again. I'll, I'll do it, is the the um, sign up form if you are interested in um, supporting long term care vaccination, the OMA and the OCF. P and others have um, uh, sent that out. So if you haven't put your name down, please do so. Um, I think one of the burning questions for many family doctors is if you're a community physician, but you have no active hospital affiliation, how do you yourself get vaccinated? And so David, I, it's, I think you wanted to answer that, right? Yeah, sure, absolutely. So as I, um, I think today, uh, a new framework uh, is gonna be released by the vaccine task force that uh, is going to uh, uh, sort of outline the prioritization. You saw earlier in Noah's slides, the sort of three phases of vaccination. Um, and it's not just about what kind of worker, but also what population either they're working with um, or setting they're, they're serving in. And so uh, a family doctor who is working in long-term care um, or providing um, you know, uh, support to these our long-term care homes that are having uh, a lot of trouble, but who in the past haven't worked in long-term care are going to be prioritized over, let's say, a community respirologist who doesn't do any hospital work. So um, I think there'll be a lot more clarity today. Uh, and clearly, we need to immunize um, our healthcare workforce that's at highest risk uh, for getting uh, COVID-19. Um, and I think the, the advice will be very helpful. Um, I think on the other piece is uh, clearly we're working on a strategy to ensure that people who are not directly connected with a hospital um, who are physicians or, or others, right? Physician, people who work in physician offices have a way of getting vaccinated. And we've definitely highlighted that to Dr. Bobosh to ensure that uh, that plan is clear. Thank you. Um, so then a few, there's there are quite a lot of different questions. Um, and also I just gonna shout out from the comments, um, Sid Feldman mentions that 8,300 long-term care residents in Toronto region were immunized as of yesterday and thanks to collective efforts. So yeah, bravo to all of you who've already been doing that work. Um, someone asked if a specialist um, can actually sign up to volunteer and, and I don't see why not. So I think they could probably just um, use that same link that we put in the chat. Um, I think- there was one. There was one question uh, in the chat that I think is uh, helpful. Um, somebody said that they vaccinated 84 patients in long-term care. Uh, it sounds like this physician works in that long-term care home. If this physician works in that long-term care home, they would just fill a regular vaccination code. Um, if they're part of a CAC, a hospital CAC, um, and has gone and and have gone in to support that home, they can build the CAC H codes. Um, but if they are usually working in that home, they would just bill uh, the regular vaccination code for those 84 patients. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so thanks for clarifying um, all of that. Um, there are a number of questions related to, um, you know, uh, allergies, immun immunocompromised states, et cetera, and who we can give the vaccine to. So I'm gonna just turn it to you, Zainab, to speak to a few of these. 
Um, so the first one you um, was is by Dorley Herman. Do we expect the current vaccines to be effective for various strains of COVID-19 viruses as they emerge? So well, this is actually a great question, and I think it's going to come up as we are learning about more and more different strains. Um, and to be honest, the answer is actually yes, because a lot of the vaccines are really focused on the spike protein, which does have similar homology or it has similarities between the different strains. So what happens is there might be some changes to it, but there's still going to be a lot of similarities within the spike protein. And the great thing about your immune system is redundancy is a big part of it. So let's picture like the spike protein has different little elements here. Your antibodies, you don't make like one antibody that kind of fits like this. You're actually going to chew it up and break it up. So there's going to be antibodies that will recognize this part, this little part of the snail, this little part here, this little part here. So there's actually antibodies being made to all these different aspects because you actually break it down to small pieces. So let's say one small piece changes between the different strains. There's still a lot of parts of it that are the same that actually keep it in this class of the same type of virus. So you're still going to have antibodies that are made to various parts of it that are not changing that still remain similar between the different strains. So that part, um, we would expect that you should still have good immunity with the different strains. And this is not unusual. You know, we see that um, with other vaccines that we have where there actually are still multiple strains within that, but they still have the baseline similar structures. Thanks, Zainab. So then there are, I mean, I, I wonder if you want to speak more generally. I know you spoke a little bit about allergies, but maybe you want to do a deeper dive into that. There are questions, for example, about the anaphylaxis risk with the vaccine. So what's an absolute contraindication? Is a severe antibiotic allergy or a food allergy? Um, there are, uh, how about Guillain-Barre syndrome? Um, there are a number of questions also, like if you've gotten COVID, can you get this vaccine? And that's maybe a little bit, you don't have to answer that one necessarily, but I'm gonna turn it over to you to, to educate us and, and we can bring up your slides if you like to. Sure, actually, you know what? This would probably be a great time to bring up um, yeah. my first slide. Brian, could you bring up um, Zainab's slides, please? Thank you. Okay. So while that's coming up, there is always, um, there is a concern, I understand, in terms of allergy and with the recent reactions that we have seen. The one thing about that I do still want to emphasize is vaccine allergy is really rare, um, to be honest, um, even with seeing a bit of an increase that we've seen in the different ones. We have to remember, this is the first time where we've had a vaccine come out where you're getting live reporting about different kinds of reactions. Typically every year, actually, there are a few cases of anaphylaxis or reactions that we think are anaphylaxis. They all get reported and then they all get investigated and then they'll get reclassified. Some of them remain anaphylaxis. Some of them get reclassified into other ones. Maybe it was vasovagal. There's a lot of different kinds of responses that can look like anaphylaxis and then they're fully investigated. And then at the end of the year, we get the final numbers for each one. With this rollout, everyone's really keenly aware and watching it. So we're going to get a lot more um, kind of reactions that we're seeing perhaps than you would know for other ones because they're not kind of reported in the news the same way and they haven't been fully investigated. The one thing I do want to impress upon everyone though is looking at the risk of reaction is really important because the risk of death from COVID is um, when I was looking at the numbers based on January 5th numbers of numbers of people with infection, number of deaths, it was about the risk was about 2.6%. And that's just everybody. Obviously, if you stratify it by age and different groups, healthcare workers, or those over a certain age, or if you look at the long-term care, that can increase quite dramatically. The risk of a reaction, um, specifically, I looked at the Pfizer one because they actually released some of the data based on 1.9 million vaccines in the US. And the risk was about 0.0005%. So it's like quite little. So you really, it is looking at risk versus benefit. And with any vaccine, we are still going to see reactions. In terms of what the specific contraindications are from an allergy perspective, it is if you have an allergy or anaphylaxis to a component of the vaccine, which you can see listed here, or if you have um, anaphylaxis to a prior dose of the vaccine. And I actually wanna comment on that last one. That is actually, so that's a contraindication to routine vaccination for your second dose. You, will, you should be then referred to see an allergist and then there will be kind of discussion as to what's the safest way to make sure that you get fully immunized, whether it's a changing brands, is it 
there's different ways that we do things for people who are allergic to vaccines. So there are ways we are able to vaccinate those who are allergic. In terms of the components, you know, the actual item that we're vaccinated again act, doesn't actually cause um, allergy. So here it's the mRNA. In other things, it's little bits of diphtheria or tetanus. Those ones you typically don't develop allergies to. When you look through these ingredients, a lot of them are things that you're routinely actually exposed to. But the one thing we do know has been associated with vac sorry with allergies in the past has been polyethylene glycol, um, and I'm going to talk about that in a few moments, but um, allergies to that is actually very rare. And I'm gonna talk about how we should ask patients about that. But what's important is what's not in this vaccine. There's no food in this vaccine. So there's no peanut, no milk, no egg, no gelatin, which is actually more of a concern for me from when I see people with vaccine allergy, all the people are more concerned about milk and egg. Gelatin is actually more of a big one. Um, there's no antibiotics. So unlike a lot of other vaccines, which may have some antibiotics in this, this one does not. There's no venom. So like bee sting, things like that, there's not in there. And other things that I thought was important to mention, which I know patients often ask about, there's no thimerosal, even though we know there's nothing wrong with thimerosal, but there's none of that in here. So there's no mercury, there's no formaldehyde, there's no dyes, there's no fetal tissue, and there's no microchips, um, which, you know, it sounds facetious, but I, I, I've been getting a lot of questions about that. Um, so actually, if we go to the next slide, because I want to talk a little bit about that PEG component really quickly. Don't ask patients if they have a PEG allergy because everybody will stare at you being very confused because no, most people don't know what polyethylene glycol is. For people who do, they will only associate it perhaps with the bowel prep, but it's actually in a lot of products. It's in like skincare products, it's in a lot of medications um, and it's in some foods and drinks as well, but there's no cases of anaphylaxis to it in foods and drinks. The key thing is if you want to ask someone, you want to screen them to know if they've had reactions to polyethylene glycol, is to ask about certain common over-the-counter medications that contain them that people generally have. So extra strength, extra strength Tylenol or any of the kind of red caplet Tylenol, the easy tabs, those have polyethylene glycol in them. Benadryl, 25 or 50 milligram, the pink caplets, which are the most commonly used, they contain polyethylene glycol. As an allergist, I really don't like the use of that medication, but it is commonly used by the population. Laxidae or any of the equivalents, peg lightly, go lightly, even react in the five and 10 milligram, the tablets, or Advil liquid gels or enteric coated ASA. And there's so many more. I just kind of listed the common ones that I think we see in use quite often. So you're best to kind of ask those questions versus asking um, if someone um, knows that they're allergic to peg. The people who have PEG allergy, I have to tell you, they're often well known to their allergist because there's so many formulations of medications that contain this. So they have to be very careful and they presented because they've had multiple reactions to seemingly unrelated medications or other things. So they're often well known and they have to like really be careful of anything they use. For the other aspects um, of the question in general, so those are the specific contraindications. Um, you know, when you look at the guiding document, it's gonna talk a little bit about if a person had a reaction to a previous um, injectable, that maybe it's worth having a discussion with an allergist, um, or if they've had a previous assessment, it's worth just touching base. And you can also do that through e-consult or just having the patient, if they're still kind of in touch with their allergist to have a discussion about that. Um, I know, sorry, there were so many questions in that chair. I don't want to miss anything. Um, so, you know, we're, we, we, there's so many questions. So we're going to just try and get to what we can. Sure. Um, so, so I guess if you had asked me about people who'd had COVID before and getting it. Um, yes. Yeah, so, it's, and I think actually Hugh is going to also speak up yeah. about that too. So um, there is a question, for example, as long, how long after having a COVID positive illness would you wait before vaccinating, for example, in a nursing home? And maybe I'll um, ask you uh, to answer that one. Happy to. Um, and links also to a, an excellent question by Dr. West around uh, immunizing during outbreaks. Um, in this situation, the we try not to give this vaccine to people who have active COVID um, symptoms. Um, so there's a few kind of criteria of how you could decide when that no longer applies. Um, I'm not sure there's really a, a full immunological response. I think the big reason is we don't want to confuse about whether or not this is a response to the vaccine or whether this is COVID getting worse. Um, so personally, I like using the same criteria we use for clearing people of um, infection control, uh, sorry, uh, precautions. Uh, so for example, in someone who has um, 
you know, mild to moderate disease, that would be 10 days after the onset of symptoms. For people who had severe disease, that's hospitalizations, ICUs, um, you're looking at 20 days after to clear. And, and so that's the criteria we use for residents, that's the criteria we use for staff, clearing them after infections. And I think that's a very conservative um, approach. Um, you know, based on conversations with a substitute decision maker, of course, you could be much more aggressive than that um, based on your individualized assessment. It's really kind of judging the, the needs of the resident and, and what's happening there. Uh, so Dr. West, to your question around the outbreaks, yeah, advocate, certainly. Um, I know in that area that that is a, a priority. Um, and, and obviously the, the targets will be the kind of, I would hope the targets would be those um, COVID negative uh, residents first. Um, and then moving on from there, I did receive a, a question from um, Anna who received the exact opposite advice. Uh, I'm going to connect with her and if I can get any understanding as to why uh, they're doing that, I'll, I'm happy to try to share it as well. Um, um, and so would you give the vaccine in a patient who's in quarantine after exposure but who tests negative for COVID? Uh, yes, yeah, so we call those people the high risk contacts um, and I personally would for sure. Um, in that situation, you're, the contraindication is the symptoms, the active COVID symptoms. Uh, and so I, I certainly would recommend that. Um, the, the tricky question is may even be those uh, asymptomatic positives. Uh, that's going to be the, the, the more difficult question. And my gut would say yes, um, because it's here. It's in the back of their nose. We don't know much else about where else it is and how quickly the immune system is responding to it. Um, but that would have to be an individualized judgment. And just to give you, you know, just from an on the ground yesterday and the day before, you know, we went into homes that were on outbreak to vaccinate. And so in floors that were suspect outbreak, uh, where a staff person tested positive, the entire um, floor had pre had, has been since tested negative by PCR. Um, and we immunized all those folks. So even though they're on com contact, sorry, droplet precaution, um, we still um, we immunized all of them, but they'd all tested negative. Thanks. Um, and so Andrew Lovestein has uh, answered, asked this question at 8.01 a.m. and we haven't got to it yet, which is we are getting a lot of questions regarding how to record a COVID vaccine in the patient's chart in the EMR. As far as I know, none of the EMR systems have COVID as a vaccination and none of the drug databases have added the two approved vaccines. Any recommendations on how to document it? Yeah, so what I've asked, um, as many of you know, because you've been getting HRM messages about your COVID-19 uh, swabs, um, and I, I've asked the team at Ontario Health to create something similar. So the good news, the, the bad news is, is that we have a, pro a provincial registry uh, that is, um, I think, frustrating to use if you speak to the people who are using the COVAX system. Uh, but the good news is we have a provincial registry. So I would, what I'm advocating for is that we get an, actually a dump uh, sort of on a monthly basis or, or some time, like I don't want them every day. I think most of us would find it really frustrating, um, but a dump of that data um, by it, by discrete patient, right? In the same way the swab data comes in discreetly um, into our EMR. And then we, hopefully the vendors can keep up, but if they come in as HRM messages, there's going to be all sorts of ways for us to sort of try to automate that process and get um, into the CPP of patients chart. So we're working on it. So um, Jennifer Potter said that she heard a PSS update this month will include it. Um, so we only have a, a short period of time, so we'll probably only get to a couple of th more things. Um, I wanted to draw people's attention to the answered questions in the Q&A, so skim those because they may have uh, an answer to the question um, that you asked already. Uh, a reminder that our uh, seminar will be recorded and you can watch the recording. And we are going to plan another one for January 22nd, where we, we will have another opportunity for Q&A. Um, I think in the remaining time, I'm going to suggest that um, there are some continued questions, um, allergy, immunology related, and there are also some questions around vaccine hesitancy, which we haven't talked about. So we're probably going to tackle those two areas. Um, so just to start with that, um, there is a question very specifically about Guillain-Barre syndrome. Um, I don't think we answered that right on, or maybe we did. And then there was, um, and, and so I don't know if David, you wanted to speak to that um, or, or Zainab? So for patients who've had Guillain-Barre, should they be referred to allergy immunology um, before they get the vaccine? I'm, I'm gonna to defer to our allergist and immunologist colleague. 
Okay, so um, for Guillain-Barre, to be honest, so Guillain-Barre can be, you know, we don't know exactly what causes it, but we do know the viral infections can um, cause Guillain-Barre. So from a vaccine perspective, the only time that we, it's a contraindication for a vaccine is if you've had it within six weeks of um, influenza infection, then it is a contraindication for influenza vaccine. So just kind of using that same kind of immunological theory, we would then, to be honest, unless you had Guillain-Barre following um, COVID within six weeks of infection of COVID, um, I don't think that it would be natural thing to actually um, just simply refuse it because of the history of Guillain-Barre, because that's not what we do for other vaccines, including live vaccines, where you're actually getting um, vaccine strain um, infection in your body. Um, if you do have a case, though, where someone's really not sure, to be honest, the actual people who often answer this question are the neurologists. So um, often we'll send them to neurologists to have a final kind of risk benefit if someone is really concerned about it. But from an immunological standpoint, we would not um, recommend avoiding it. And it's not one of the listed things to avoid this vaccine. Thanks, Zainab. And I think David posted the CDC link in the chat. Um, there are some questions to you just more about the mRNA vaccine, um, what cells in the body take it up, um, how does it work around that, um, and then there's also some questions to you specifically about autoimmune illness. Okay, um, so I'm going to try to be quick with the mRNA one. So this vaccine, yes, contains mRNA, but every time you actually get infected with any virus, the different cells do pick it up. So it could be your muscle cells, your epithelial dermal cells, there's a variety of different cells that are at the site who are gonna kind of munch this up and are gonna have all of a sudden makes these proteins and show this protein. And then we have antigen presenting cells, dendritic cells, various cells who are gonna come and take that, break it up into little pieces and show our immune system. So this is actually happening every single time you're exposed to any kind of a virus. So this is not unusual. Um, so because you're, that's what your antigen presenting cells do every time with it, with an infection. They are like, hey, look at this, I found this. What do you think, what do you think? And so they do that all the time. You're not gonna, that does not predispose you to getting autoimmune disease from this, um, from this virus or from this um, vaccine. The, if you look at some of the entities that have some autoimmune aspects to them, it's because that actual protein looks like our own protein. So the spike protein doesn't look like our proteins. So by seeing the spike protein does not um, make your body recognize other parts of your body, okay? So um, it won't make um, autoimmune disease to the antigen presenting cells, but it will be taken up by various cells and shown on their cell surface and then the antigen presenting cells will take it and present it to the immune system. Autoimmune disease, um, actually, as I said earlier, when we we're talking about the immunocompromised, it's actually that whole category in that statement paper was autoimmune and immunocompromised. And so for the autoimmune ones, um, there's a variety of them. It could be Sjogren's, it could be RA. And there's actually a statement from the rheumatological society that addresses um, the various autoimmune ones, but essentially really it's still that risk benefit and there's not really um, a huge risk for them. You know, in the past we used to worry would the flu vaccine be worse for people with autoimmune disease, but we've seen that that did not flare up their disease because there's always concern, what if you activate their immune system, is it going to cause issues with their other immune issues, but that hasn't been shown with the other vaccines. So we wouldn't um, de-recommend these for those with that. And if they're on immunosuppressants for it, similarly, it's kind of falls within that whole statement. Once that is available, I think that this will be really helpful for you because I'll have the links to the different societies and you'll have that document in hand. And I think you're gonna feel a lot more comfortable about it. I'm sorry, it's not up online yet, but it will be shortly from what I understand. So um, that will address that for you. And I think you'll feel more comfortable from that perspective. Yeah. Um, so we haven't had a chance to really address vaccine hesitancy and I you know, don't want to do it short shrift. Um, the other question that I think is important is people have been asking about vaccine preventing transmission to others and whether we also have to continue to wear masks um, and gowns and gloves, etc. once we have the vaccine. And I, I just feel like that's an important enough question that we should speak to it um, out loud. So David or Noah, do you want to take that one? Or Hugh? Or... Somebody. Sure. Uh, I think I'll, I'll let Noah speak to it. All I would say ahead of time is that um, we, you know, I, I'm glad that there was over 700 people on the call today because we are the army of people that are going to not just address it with our patients, but you'll hear from Noah in a minute 
address it with our friends and colleagues who are clergy. Um, and so the important thing that we do right now is that we, if we understand ourselves what the concerns are because most of the people who have concerns over vaccine um, have reasonable concerns. It's new, they don't understand how it works. It's been designed so quickly compared to others. And the more that we understand what those common concerns are, uh, not that there's a chip in the vaccine, but the real common concerns, that's gonna be that, that squishy middle that we as family doctors are gonna be able to have an effect on. So I'll let Noah maybe speak to what's going on with regard to the vaccine hesitancy. Yeah, I, 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 Tara's right that we don't have time to address it fully. And we, we need you all to be the, the you know, capable and confident in answering questions. Um, I would urge you to go to the CEP website to check things out and we can have more sessions about it for sure. Just to answer Tara's direct question around transmission, we don't have the data yet. Um, we, we know that the vaccines stop you from getting sick from COVID. We don't know for sure that it stops transmission. And so until we know that, everybody who is vaccinated still has to follow public health guidance, unfortunately. Um, I'm hoping that in the next two months, we'll, have, uh, we'll start to see data about, fingers crossed, that it helps with transmission, uh, but, but I can't say that with any certainty yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so you know, we didn't have time to talk about vaccine hesitancy today, but we will get to it in our January 22nd session. I think that today really the focus was to try and answer your questions so that you feel comfortable. Um, and I think that's the first step in us helping to address vaccine hesitancy um, among our staff, our colleagues, and, uh, and, and, and then eventually among the public. And, uh, and so um, as, as usual, our recording will be made available next week on Monday. Um, we'll share it to all of you. You will also get a main pro certificate eventually. Um, we'll send you the information for our next session shortly. Please do check out the Ontario College website or the and the Center for Effective Practice website where there are a lot of resources um, available, uh, um, many of which we went over today. So uh, lastly, a huge thanks to our panelists who've just been fielding tons of questions, um, 51 answered questions in addition to all of our live questions. Um, and we will summarize some of the Q&A for you when we send out uh, your, uh, before, uh, before we send out your main pro. So probably next week you'll get that in email. So thank you to Zainab, Noah, Hugh, David, uh, Liz and um, all of our back crew, uh, the OCFP team and our U of T team, including Brian, who uh, makes sure technically all of this runs soundly. Thanks Thank again. you all for looking after your patients. Yeah.